In CT imaging, we often use contrast media to create subject contrast in the patients we're imaging. There are several types of contrast media that may be used, and there are various routes of administration. The most common contrast agents used in CT are iodinated contrast agents. Iodine has a relatively high atomic number of 53, and therefore it attenuates a proportionally higher number of X-ray photons than most of the body's tissues. This means that when we inject iodinated contrast into the vascular system, we will see that vasculature show up brightly on a CT scan. Or if we have the patient drink an iodinated contrast agent, we will see that bright radiopaque contrast in the digestive tract. There are also other routes of contrast administration like rectally or through a urethral catheter or through an intraosseous access into the bone. But in this video, we'll briefly discuss oral contrast and then we'll primarily focus on IV contrast. Oral contrast is administered often in conjunction with IV contrast to patients undergoing abdominal imaging. Oral contrast allows radiologists to discriminate between contrast filled bowel and surrounding structures within the abdomen. So the whole digestive tract is visualized with contrast on the scan. Intravenous contrast is the most common route of administration, and often the CT technologist will be the one preparing the patient for the contrast by obtaining IV access, typically in the hand or the antecubital fossa. Often the antecubital fossa is the easiest site to access, and it has relatively large veins which can accommodate a high flow rate for contrast injection. The right antecubital fossa provides the most direct route into the heart for a peripheral IV. Central venous access devices such as PIC lines or porta caths can also be used for IV contrast injection, as long as they're approved for use with a power injector system, which we will talk about shortly. Before obtaining IV access, the technologist should explain to the patient why they are getting contrast, obtain consent, and identify if the patient has any risk factors which may contraindicate the use of contrast. Those risk factors could be whether the patient has an allergy to contrast, if the patient has two or more other anaphylactic type allergies uh, or has had a contrast reaction in the past, if the patient is currently on chemotherapy, if the patient has diabetes or if they're taking metformin, if they have a history of kidney or liver disease, if they're greater than 65 years of age, or if they have elevated creatinine levels, which indicates that their kidney function is impaired. It's important to check the creatinine levels for patients who have risk factors because iodinated contrast is excreted through the kidneys. So we want to ensure that the patient will be able to eliminate the contrast without further damaging the kidneys. To add to the point about renal function, we'll also calculate the effective GFR, which we will talk about shortly. Once we have IV access and the patient is on the CT table, we're ready to inject the contrast. For most scans, there will be a predetermined delay between the start of a contrast injection and the start of a scan, depending on the structures of interest. A chest scan, for example, will normally begin about 30 seconds after the start of the contrast injection, so there is time for the contrast to fill both the venous and arterial structures within the chest. A typical abdomen and pelvis scan will start around 70 seconds after the start of an injection because this is how long it takes the contrast to reach the portal venous system. These different timing protocols are referred to as phases of contrast enhancement, and you can dive more into the differences in phases of enhancement when you look into each individual scan protocol and body area. Intravenous contrast is normally injected with a power injector. The power injector is a machine designed to inject IV contrast at a rapid and constant rate to introduce a bolus of contrast into the patient's vascular system in a short period of time. The flow rate is often between two and three milliliters per second for routine studies on adult patients, but can be five or six milliliters per second for studies requiring a very concentrated short bolus, as in CT angiography studies, which look specifically at the vessels themselves. As well as varying the flow rate, the total contrast volume required can vary as well, depending on the patient size, the body area being scanned, and the type of scan being performed. Before, during, and after the contrast injection, both the technologist and the patient must be aware of normal side effects of contrast media administration, as well as the signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction to contrast media. Normal side effects can include a warm flush feeling, 
a warm sensation in the bladder that feels like they're urinating, or a metallic or garlicky taste in the throat. Adverse reactions to contrast media can be categorized into mild, moderate, and severe reactions. Mild reactions could include a cough, itchiness, hives, some eye swelling, or nasal congestion. Moderate reactions could include respiratory issues, swelling of the airway, variations in pulse and blood pressure. Severe reactions could include life-threatening respiratory distress, the patient could become unresponsive, and respiratory or cardiac arrest could occur. The radiologist should be called quickly to assess the patient in the event of any reaction as the signs of a mild reaction can quickly escalate to a moderate or life-threatening situation. Moderate or severe reactions might warrant the administration of epinephrine and most CT departments will always have an EpiPen nearby so that epinephrine can be administered quickly in the event of a reaction. The tech should always be aware of the location of the nearest crash cart and the protocol to initiate in the event of a life-threatening reaction. Adverse events other than allergic reactions can occur from IV contrast administration. We discussed kidney function earlier, and this is important because if we administer contrast to a patient with impaired renal function, we are at risk of causing contrast-induced nephropathy, where the patient experiences an acute kidney injury or decrease in kidney function as a direct result of contrast injection. Our best method of preventing this is to make sure we only administer contrast to patients who have healthy kidneys by checking the creatinine levels, or if it's an emergency situation where there is no time to check the blood work, only administer contrast if the benefit and necessity of the scan outweighs those risks. From the creatinine levels, we can estimate the effective glomerular filtration rate, or EGFR, which is a measure of kidney function. An EGFR over 60 is normal, between 45 and 60 indicates slightly reduced kidney function, between 30 and 45 indicates significantly reduced kidney function, and then below 30 indicates severe kidney damage. One final complication which can arise from the contrast administration is the extravasation of contrast. In this scenario, the contrast agent is delivered by the power injector, but it doesn't go into the venous system. Instead, it goes into the surrounding space around the injection site. In this scenario, the patient will almost always complain of pain at the IV site while or after the injection has happened, and there will be an obvious hardness under the skin at the site of injection. The technologist should always check that the IV is working and flushing properly with saline before injecting contrast to try to prevent this from happening. If it does happen, the patient should be advised to apply compression at the site, and in most cases, the contrast will be absorbed and eliminated. In rare occurrences, contrast extravasation can lead to further complications at the site, such as compartment syndrome where the swelling causes impairment of blood flow. If extravasation is actively occurring, the injection should be stopped immediately, and the technologist will often have to find an alternative eye view site and repeat the injection to acquire the scan. As always, thanks for watching and keep up the hard work.